Hey there, I'm Mike Rignetta. This is Crash Course Theater, and today we're going all the way from Broadway to off-Broadway, which Yorick reminds me is actually not that far from Broadway. Are those MapQuest directions? Why are we going to off-Broadway at all? Look, mid-century Broadway is great. It has incisive social dramas and dancing girls, though not usually in the same show. But in the middle of the 20th century, Broadway only had 30-some theaters, which was not nearly enough for producers to take a chance on all of that avant-garde goodness. So today, we'll look at the history of off-Broadway and the genres, styles, and troops that it supported, including the Black Arts Movement. Lights up. Unless lights are too normal for your weird show. Off-Broadway theater had actually been around for a long time before anyone started calling it that. It's the natural continuation of the little theater movement that we explored in our episodes on American Moderns and the Harlem Renaissance. In New York, that meant theaters like the Provincetown Players, the Washington Square Players, the Neighborhood Playhouse, and the Krigwa Players. After World War II, new theaters and companies appeared, and this movement became known as Off-Broadway. If you want to get technical, off-Broadway used to refer to theaters outside of the Broadway Box, a stretch that ran from 40th to 54th Streets in Manhattan. And that leaves a lot of city. Originally, most off-Broadway theaters were located in Greenwich Village, often in the same spaces that the little theaters had occupied. Eventually, off-Broadway became an actor's equity designation concerning theater size, referring to theaters in Manhattan that have between 100 and 499 seats. But off-Broadway is also a mindset. It's against shallow, big-budget entertainment and in favor of ensemble-driven, non-commercial work. But of course, plenty of off-Broadway stuff ends up transferring to Broadway and turns out to be very commercial, so, I mean, you know, you might be surprised to learn that this bit about theater is complicated. In the early days, a lot of off-Broadway theaters were interested in producing the European avant-garde because America was apparently not absurdist enough on its own. But off-Broadway theaters also helped to develop a new American avant-garde and were supportive of works by queer writers and writers of color. Let's look at a few significant theaters and troops. The Living Theater, Jose Quintero's Circle in the Square, and Joe Papp's New York Shakespeare Festival and Public Theater. The Living Theater was founded in 1947 by Judith Molina and Julian Beck. They started out producing Brecht and Cocteau and Pirandello, but in the late 1950s, they began producing new American work, like Jack Gelber's The Connection, an immersive play about drug addicts, and Kenneth H. Brown's The Brig, a brutal play about a military prison. The Living Theater then relocated to Europe. This was partly because of an unfortunate tax thing. Anarchists do not like paying taxes. The company reinvented themselves as a devised theater company, meaning a company that creates its own original works through rehearsal and exploration. Artaud was a big influence. The Living Theater created a bunch of pretty shocking, occasionally nude, and very participatory pieces like Paradise Now and Mysteries and Smaller Pieces, and brought them back to New York. These shows are basically where all of our cliches about experimental theater come from. Long hair, loincloths, naked screaming, naked rolling around on the floor, naked screaming and rolling around on the floor with long hair. But try to remember that these things weren't cliches when the Living Theater did them. The Circle in the Square Theater was founded in Greenwich Village in 1951 by Jose Quintero, the son of Panamanian parents. It was sort of a theater in disguise because it was originally housed in a former nightclub and licensed as a cabaret space. This meant that the actors, a bunch of whom lived on site, also had to serve drinks. Circle in the Square made some gestures towards the European avant-garde, but under Quintero's passionate direction, it's best known for cementing the legacy of Tennessee Williams and rehabilitating the work of Eugene O'Neill, who had fallen way out of favor. The consummate Circle in the Square work is probably Quintero's 1956 revival of O'Neill's The Iceman Cometh, which had pretty much flopped the first time around. It starred Navy veteran Almost Egot and awesome actor Jason Robards, who at the time was still driving taxis. The New York Times wrote that since Circle in the Square had originally been a nightclub, it was the perfect place to house O'Neill's waterfront dive. It seems not like something written, but like something that is happening, wrote the critic. So take that, Broadway. Circle in the Square became known for an intense acting style, introducing audiences to influential actors like Geraldine Page, Colleen Dewhurst, and George C. Scott. 
The theater moved to the South Village in 1960, and then in 1972, it moved, surprise, to Broadway. Joe Papp was born in Brooklyn to Yiddish-speaking parents. After a stint in the Navy and some time out in California with former members of the group theater, he returned to New York and began to stage free Shakespeare plays in a Lower East Side church, insisting that Shakespeare could and should be for everyone. In 1956, the Parks Department gave him permission to use the East River Amphitheater. Robert Moses, then the Parks Commissioner, told him that he would have to charge admission fees, but Pap refused. Shakespeare should be free for all. And the courts supported him. A permanent theater was built for him in Central Park. It opened in 1962, and free Shakespeare is still performed there every summer. Show up early. It gets crowded quick. In 1966, Pat moved into what had been the Astor Library on Lafayette Street and transformed it into the Public Theater, which you can still visit today. It's adjacent to another music theater and nightclub venue called... Joe's Pub. Some of the public theater's hits include Hair, A Chorus Line, For Colored Girls Who Have Considered Suicide When the Rainbow Is Enough, The Normal Heart, and yes, Hamilton, which rumor has it is very good. Pap's legacy is really important. He insisted on staging the classics with diverse casts. He championed queer writers and writers of color, and he demanded that theater could and should be available to everyone. Theater, he said, is a social force, not just entertainment. Off-Broadway also helped foster the Black Arts Movement, the cultural wing of the Black Power Movement. The Black Arts Movement has its roots far from Broadway, mostly with the Free Southern Theater, which toured plays like Waiting for Godot around the Deep South. But the Black Arts Movement was specifically about encouraging African-American artists and suggesting that their work was part of a tradition separate from the cultural work of white artists. The movement allied itself with post-colonial independence movements in Africa and around the world. One of the movement's leaders was the poet and playwright Amiri Baraka, who began his career as Leroy Jones. His 1965 poem, Black Art, written after the assassination of Malcolm X, became a manifesto for the movement. In one section, he wrote, We want a black poem and a black world. Let the world be a black poem. And let all black people speak this poem silently or loud. Braca's most famous play is probably Dutchman, which opened at Off-Broadway's Cherry Lane Theater in 1964. It's set on a subway car where Lula, a white woman, meets Clay, a black man. Lula mocks Clay and tempts him, finally goading him into admitting the anger he feels towards white people, even though he says that he would never act on that anger. Lula then stabs Clay, and with the help of the other passengers, she throws his dead body out of the car. She then waits for the next black man. The most important playwright to emerge from the black arts movement and one of the greatest living American playwrights is Adrienne Kennedy. Let's take a look at her breakthrough play, Funny House of a Negro, which opened off-Broadway in 1964 at the East End Theater. Funny House is another word for a carnival fun house or a mad house, and the play explores the devastating effects of racism on a young woman. It filters the style of the European avant-garde through the spirit of the black arts movement. Help us out, Thought Bubble. Funny House of a Negro is set in the bedroom of a young African-American woman named Sarah, but it's also immediately clear that we're inside Sarah's mind. You can feel this even in the stage directions. In the middle of the stage, in a strong white light, while the rest of the stage is in unnatural blackness. The action is often interrupted by a harsh, frightening knocking at the door, the sound of Sarah's father trying to come in. After a prologue in which a woman in a white nightgown crosses the stage carrying a bald head in her arms, the play begins with a conversation between Queen Victoria and the Duchess of Habsburg about whiteness. The woman in the nightgown interrupts. She's Sarah's mother, distraught. She says she should never have let a black man touch her. The scene shifts to Sarah's landlady, who tells us that Sarah's father killed himself when Patrice Lumumba, the Congolese independence leader, was assassinated, and that Sarah hasn't left her room since. Also, Sarah's hair is falling out. Sarah says that the landlady is wrong. She killed her father, clubbing him with a black skull. But we later learn that he may have actually left the family and married a white woman. The Duchess has a conversation with a character named Raymond, the proprietor of the funny house. They talk about how Sarah's mother is in an asylum, how her hair has all fallen out, and how Sarah is the product of rape. Patrice Lumumba gives a speech, and then the Duchess talks with Jesus. The scene changes to a jungle, and the characters reappear, haloed and screaming. 
The scene returns to Sarah's room, and Sarah is discovered hanged. Thanks, Thought Bubble. That was upsetting and hallucinatory, but it's supposed to be upsetting and hallucinatory. The play is about one woman wrestling with identity in a racialized world, but it's also about how black artists and intellectuals fight to find their own voices in a world in which almost all of the models and precedents or white. Adrienne Kennedy's voice is distinct. Her precise, surreal style is built on personal anguish and experience, and is deeply concerned with what it means to be a woman of color in a white world. Her work also expands the boundaries of what theater can do, and finds a new stage language for stories previously unseen in the American theater. She's still writing today, and is widely revered as a mentor figure by young African American playwrights. By the 1960s, there was a problem. Off-Broadway had gotten fancy. Work had become increasingly commercial, and costs were higher. And that's how we get off, off-Broadway. Like Off-Broadway, this was a more or less spontaneous movement, and it kicked off in four downtown spaces. Cafe Chino, Theater Genesis, Judson Poets Theater, and La Mama. Cafe Chino, run by Joe Chino, was literally a coffee house, but it gave playwrights, especially queer playwrights, space to try out their work. The Judson Poets Theater was run by Al Carmines, an assistant minister, out of the Judson Memorial Church. It became a space for art world happenings and experimental dance. Theater Genesis was housed in another church, St. Mark's Church in the Bowery, which was later the home of Richard Foreman's Ontological Hysteric Theater. Run by Ralph Cook, Theater Genesis encouraged poets and playwrights to improvise with their actors. La Mama was founded in 1961 by Ellen Stewart, a former swimsuit designer. Exuberant and welcoming, she supported many New York artists and later provided residencies to several European companies. La Mama is still going today. Funnily enough, I've worked at shows in all three of these places. I also sat next to Lou Reed at La Mama once. Thanks for watching. Next time, Yorick and I are gonna be poor and downtrodden, more so than usual when we explore poor theater and the theater of the oppressed. But until then, wait, can we even afford a curtain? Okay, budget curtain. Crash Course Theater is filmed in Indianapolis, Indiana, and is produced with the help of all of these very nice people. Our animation team is Thought Cafe. Crash Course exists thanks to the generous support of our patrons at Patreon. Patreon is a voluntary subscription service where you can support the content you love through a monthly donation and help keep Crash Course free for everyone forever. Thanks for watching.